Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. Microphone check, one, two, CC, hello and welcome, CC, hello and welcome, one, two, three, four, five, six, she sells seashells by the seashore, she sells seashells by the seashore, there we go, rolling. There are two ways of respecting a reality in a documentary film. You can you can kind of relay on what you're filming with the synchron sound of this instant, yes, but it is also sometimes very interesting to record sound and only sound and then maybe use this sound with other pictures because sometimes it will bring you something very interesting. Hello and welcome to The Documentary Life, a show that sets out to inspire and inform you on how to best live and lead your own documentary life. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is episode number 73. And it is brought to you by Barong Films, proud creators of Documentary Film, The Documentary Life Podcast, and The Documentary Academy, our industry-changing A to Z documentary filmmaking program that will transform you into the documentary filmmaker that you've always wanted to be. Find out more at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. Back in 2003, I was working at a Marriott as a supervisor for the valet staff there. I'd been working in the hotel industry for about two years. When I first took a hotel job, it was always meant to be a temporary thing, but I, I didn't really know what was going to happen next. I only knew that I was very unhappy working in hotels and that I still clung on to the dream of making it big in films, even though I'd only had one digital feature to my name that absolutely nobody outside of my family and friends even knew about. One day that summer, my housemate, who also happened to be my landlord, he asked me if I'd ever be interested in going to Cambodia for six months and working on his documentary film. The guy that he initially had in mind for sound, as it would turn out, he had some other film commitments in L.A. and wouldn't be able to go with him to Cambodia. Now, Sky knew that I didn't have any sound experience, but he also knew that I was fresh off of my digital feature, and that I had a passion for filmmaking, and that I could probably learn at least the basics of sound or what I'd need to know about sound and in fairly short order. That is, of course, if I was interested in, you know, leaving my valet supervisor position to accompany him to this far-off exotic place in Southeast Asia. Now, I took all of 30 seconds before blurting out, yes, please. And of course, the rest is history. You've heard much of this story as it is. I'd spend the next six months stepping lightly over landmine and UXO-laden fields, you know, carrying a boom pole and a small Tascam mixer around my neck, constantly connected in sort of umbilical fashion, if you will, to the back of Sky's camera, you know, doing 12-hour days, six days a week on the documentary film that would become known as Bomb Hunters. It's where and how I fell in love with Cambodia and the genre of documentary. During that time, I would develop a massive appreciation for the sound person, for the position of sound. Since this was a very small crew, operating often in running gun fashion, I functioned as both the boom operator and the sound mixer. And later on, during a Christmas holiday, I would end up editing a fundraising trailer for the film, or at least using the footage that we'd shot up to that point. And my appreciation for sound and how it could and, and maybe couldn't work, it only deepened throughout that week that I was editing the, the, the fundraising trailer. We've talked on the show about how sound can often be an overlooked component to the whole doc filmmaking process. How sometimes, as independent doc filmmakers, we can become so focused on how our films look that we sometimes neglect how we're making our films sound. 
And then we find out the hard way how difficult it is to repair some maybe shoddy sound work later on when we go into post-production. So when we come back from a brief break, I'm going to give you five tips for getting good sound on your dock. And then after that, we're going to have a conversation with award-winning sound engineer, Jean Umansky, who's done sound on over 50 films, both features and documentary, including an Oscar nomination for his sound work on the film Amelie. All of that brilliant discussion on sound coming up next on The Documentary Life. Okay, so let's get started on our five tips for getting good sound on your dock. Number one, test your gear. This may seem like an, a rather obvious thing, but believe me, it's easy, especially if you're operating as a one-man crew, to neglect testing all of your gear. That means not just your camera and lenses. It means your sound gear, your shotgun mic, your lavalier set, your external sound recorder if you're using one, all of it. Your cables, you name it, all of it. Yes, it probably seems like a bit of a hassle, but I can tell you, if there's one set of gear that can give you trouble, and often when you least can afford for it to happen, it's your sound gear. Especially if you're using a wireless lav. I cannot tell you how many times I've had issues with wireless lavs, whether it's because I'm operating in an environment that causes some interference, or batteries run out, or the squelch setting is not right. Wireless lavs, they can be a true headache, which is why it's best to maybe iron all of this out well beforehand. Hook it up to your camera or your external recorder and make sure you've got a clean signal. Believe me, you don't want to be fiddling with this stuff while you're on set or location and you're shooting. The worst feeling is when you're conducting an interview and you have to stop in the middle of it, you know, to troubleshoot why your sound's not functioning properly. One, it's nerve-wracking and anxious, and it and and it also and two, it doesn't really instill confidence in your subject that you know what you're doing, or at the very least, it interrupts the natural flow of an interview. Look, you already have enough on your plate that needs your attention, so you want to be able to rely on your sound gear functioning properly. The best way that you can do this is to test all of your sound gear out before a shoot, and I'm talking each and every time that you do this. Number two, bring your headphones. Another perhaps seemingly obvious or harmless suggestion, right? But don't tell me that you haven't ever forgotten to bring a pair of headphones. Actually, please don't tell me that you haven't because then I'll be even more shamed and embarrassed that I certainly have. It sucks, I can promise. Because not only do you have no way to monitor the actual sound of your sound, but then you're relying on your camera op or you yourself if, if you're the one doing the shooting, which means you have to now monitor the sound by simply, you know, watching the levels on your camera. So sure, your sound levels may be okay while you're shooting, but you won't hear should the lav start, I don't know, getting interference somewhere or if your subject is making some unwanted sounds or the lav, it may be rubbing against their, their ties or, or other clothing. There are a zillion different spurious sounds that you wouldn't pick up if you weren't actually monitoring with a pair of headphones. So do what I do. I have a pair of headphones that never leaves my sound kit. It's a part of that kit. I don't use these headphones to listen to my records. I don't use them to edit with. Their only purpose is for recording sound. And therefore, they are a part of my sound kit and they only leave my sound kit when I'm using them to record sound. Okay, enough about headphones, you get it. <laughs> Number three is to think about location. Just as you would think and even scout, or recce for my UK filmmakers out there, for places to shoot interviews or scenes, you should also be considering this for recording of your sound as well. For instance, if you're shooting at a banquet or a dance hall and you want to interview one of the participants, it's probably a good idea if you can get away from the banquet area or the dance hall so as to get good sound. Otherwise, there'll be a ton of background noise. And you don't want to have to shout to conduct the interview, and you don't want your audience later on to strain to hear that interview. And you certainly don't want to be editing that mess. That much I can promise you. 
If you're shooting a sit down interview, ensure that you're not in a room that has a lot of echo. Or if you're in an area where a loud refrigerator or an air conditioner is operating, make sure that you have the option to temporarily switch these things off. Carpeted areas help dampen sound, as do curtains. Sometimes you may have a sound that's impossible to exclude from an environment. If this is the case, simply make sure to have the object of that sound slightly in frame. It doesn't have to be obvious or anything, but it, it gives the viewer something, something that helps them understand what they're hearing, and it allows them to maybe even forgive and embrace the sound. It gives context for the location that we're in. Number four, clothing rustle. Now, I mentioned earlier how if you weren't wearing a pair of headphones, you might not hear the law of rubbing against someone's clothing. Clothing rustle is something we dock lifers are seemingly always battling with, especially if we're trying to hide the lav mic from sight of the camera. One handy tip is that you can use some double-sided stick tape, you know, placing the tape on both sides of the lav, and that way the lav will be able to be mounted between a subject's skin and their clothing. When done right, this can definitely minimize movement of mic and rustling against clothing. If you want to check out some other different ways that you can hide a mic without getting the clothes rustle sound, I'm going to post a video up in the show notes for this episode that gives you some other options. I will just mention that if you don't have to hide the lav, don't. The best possible sound quality that you're going to get is if the lav isn't impeded by any piece of clothing at all. And nowadays, especially with sit-down interviews, an audience has become quite accustomed to seeing a lav, certainly in documentaries. Now, we may, we may talk about this a little bit later on when we talk with our guest, John Umansky. Uh, he's a professional. He's a pro, guys. And he's definitely going to have a little, a little different take on this. But I'll, 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 I'll leave it until we get to that. And last but not least, number five is consider using a wired lav. I can't tell you the number of times I've been on set and I'm wiring up a lav to someone and they seem surprised to see lengthy SLR cables on the end of it running back to the camera. Well, let me just tell you that I am a huge proponent of going old school when it comes to the lavalier. If I can, I will always use a wired lavalier. That is, it's attached to an XLR cable, again, going to the camera or an external recorder. I'll use this instead of my wireless lav set. It seems archaic, I get it, but I would much rather do this knowing that I'll have zero potential for any kind of radio interference. Nine out of 10 times, I use this cabled lav setup. I've just been burnt too many times using the wireless lav. Even if I've done the aforementioned testing of the sound gear, I've had numerous instances where as soon as I get the subject wired up and we start rolling cameras, some kind of interference starts happening. And then you have to stop the shoot and figure out how to get a solid signal all over again. So yeah, while it's a little added hassle stringing out an XLR cable, cable from camera to the subject, it is well worth the time. Certainly it is to me. There are, of course, times where it makes the most sense to go wireless, certainly if you're following a subject around. But, but if I'm conducting a sit-down interview, I'll always try and use the cabled version of a lav setup. So those are five tips for getting good sound on your dock. If you haven't been using some of these strategies already, I'd strongly recommend doing so in future projects. They're pretty straightforward tips, the ones that will be integral to the overall success of sound in your film. If you'd like to see these tips written out, I'll post them in the accompanying show notes for this episode. Simply visit our website by going to thedocumentarylife.com. All right, next up, let's deepen this discussion on sound for your documentary when we hear from a true industry professional. Stay tuned for our conversation with sound extraordinaire Jean Umensky. There are plenty of places online to learn how to do things like split the audio signals coming into your camera, or how to animate some of your still photos, or get some great tips on lighting your interview, many blogs, YouTube videos, and of course podcasts where you can quickly grab an answer to a tech-related question. But what if there was one place where you could learn from beginning to end how to make a documentary film and how to become a doc filmmaker, how to raise money and build an audience for your doc, how to form strategic partnerships and launch your doc out into the world, and perhaps even, if you can imagine, make some money from it. 
Well, there is such a place, and it's called the Documentary Academy. Steph and I took two years to build out this comprehensive resource that takes you step-by-step step from story creation and pre-production all the way to post-production, launch, and distribution. The Academy takes you through your doc filmmaking journey as your most confident, active, strategic, creative, focused, and articulate self. It is a step-by-step -step guide to empowerment in the documentary filmmaking world. We know what we have in the Documentary Academy. Now it's up to you to discover what you have as a doc filmmaker. Do that today by heading over to thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. I have the distinct honor and pleasure of bringing my guest on to today's episode of The Documentary Life. His name is Jean Umansky, and Jean has experience working in the sound production field as a sound engineer in over 50 films, both in narrative as well as documentary, including the likes of Amelie, Incendies, and the documentary Nanette. Jean Umansky, bonjour and welcome to The Documentary Life. Thank you. Hello, Chris. I'm very happy to have you with us today. We've been trying to coordinate this conversation for a little while now. Uh, you've been obviously a very busy man with your work as of late. You come highly recommended uh, actually by a listener of this program who actually worked with you a bit uh, on, on incendies. And we'll get, we'll get to that in a little bit, but, um, but I'm glad to finally be, be connecting with you. And I'm excited to be having this conversation about specifically sound because we have yet to have someone on the program um, with your expertise who can speak to this. And so very excited to have you with us. Jean, I think a good way to start out would be to have you give us some idea of how and when really film production began in your life. How did you start out in the field? Well, I started as a student directly, kind of. I was excited about, uh, about recording music. I think lots of young persons going to sound uh, world go through the, the dream of recording music. That's what I was after when I, uh, when I went to this uh, French uh, sound school. Oh. And then after that, this school, I, I, I had the opportunity to go in a cinema school, French cinema, which was the IDEC uh, Institut des oh, Hautes yeah. Études Cinématographiques, which is now the FEMIS. And I did some sound for the scholar films, which was the, the, the kind of fantastic experience for me because I did plenty of mistakes <laughs> and I learned uh, that way lots of things that uh, on that period. Yeah. So that is kind of the, the, the way I went in the, in, in, in the sound uh, and so you actually you actually entered into film production as a sound person then? Is that how you actually started out? Yes, exactly. It is. Okay, okay. Excellent. I, I, have, I have met a number of, of sound persons uh, through my time in working both commercial and documentary. And I would say there seems to be a split down the middle. Half of them... As you have, as you have alluded to, were musicians and they were sound recordists prior to film production. The other half got into film first because film was a passion for them, and then they became sound people um, through working in film. Uh, it's interesting, Jean. I myself, I I have a. Uh, a, a little bit of a sound sort of background in, in terms of film. The first ever, the first ever professional film gig that I myself ever did uh, was back in 2003 and 2004. And it was, I had been hired to work on a documentary that would take me for six months into Cambodia, a country at that time I had never been to. And I had been working sort of, um, 
uh, I, I was I was a sort of passionate and uh, I guess a film enthusiast, and I had done a, a digital feature. Um, I had direct written and directed and edited a digital feature myself, but I wasn't working at the time in film at all. It was still very much a dream. It was a hobby, and a, a gentleman had hired me, and then really partnering with him for to be responsible for all of the sound. So he would do all of the video, and I would do all of the sound, and it was. Uh, an incredible and a very intense experience spending those six months in a developing country like Cambodia. And at the time I was, and you can appreciate this as a sound person, you'll appreciate. I was always tethered directly to his camera because we weren't using wireless with the exception of, of some interviews we were going wireless, but most of the time it was, you know, I had my little Tascam sound mixer around my neck. I'm holding the boom pole, which is tied directly to the back of his camera. And we really went around the countryside of, of Cambodia in that fashion. And that was really how I broke into, into film production. Now, uh, I didn't stay in the sound field, uh, but that's how I broke into film. And I, I very much have an appreciation for sound, not only from those experiences, but I'm I'm kind of a music geek myself. And so, uh, so, so there you have it, Sean. <laughs> but yes, I imagine very well that. And but you know, the well, the 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 uh, I I don't know, I don't. I don't know, but I think luck, uh, you were very lucky, and I was That's very right. lucky to, to do fantastic uh, trips, plenty of countries uh, around the world. But I think there's a part of luck in, uh, in, this, <laughs> in this work. Things happen. In French, we say by uh, par hasard. That's right. <laughs> uh, and, and sometimes there's come up some, some, some fantastic experience that come from there. I well, did kind of. A, a extraordinary uh, trips in in China uh. at the beginning of the nineties, uh, where I kind of discovered uh, a whole world which was absolutely fantastic. It was much. Uh, it was long before China turned to a very modern country. So right. the places we were visiting were incredible. <laughs> uh, what what provinces were you in? Do you remember? Oh yes, I went plenty of places. We were in the Gobi Desert. Yeah. Then we were also in the very south in the Wuyong uh, province, yeah. which is uh, very south of China. Also in the holy sacred mountains mm. uh, somewhere. I don't remember exactly the state it was. We were in Chongqing, mm. which at that time was kind of fantastic port on the Yangtze Kong uh, River, you know? Yeah, yeah. Where yeah. the boats come. But uh, it was kind of incredible work. Really. And were you doing commercial or documentary work when you were there? It was a documentary. Oh. It was a documentary film with a very old documentary filmmaker uh, whose name is Joris Evans. He was a, a Dutch director yeah. who started filming sometime around uh, uh, 1918. Wow. He, his first films were very... He, he at one time lived uh, with Eisenstein. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> he did the very first uh, documentary, which were mute of course at that time fantastic films uh called the bridge and a, a film called the rain also he was filming rain and then after in his uh life he did he was kind of a revolutionary and he was involved in the chinese revolution so uh his camera was the only camera the communist uh had during the uh, 1948 oh. revolution. He was a Ben Shui. So he had an incredible life, and it was the kind of last uh, film he he did, which was a film, uh, which is a very nice film. The title in French is uh, Une Histoire de Vent, I think, in probably in English it is something like a story about the wind. He was 93 when we did this film. He was a very, oh, very old my man. God. 
He was 93 years old and he was still doing documentary film. Now that's inspiring. <laughs> he was, he, 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 he's a very important uh, filmmaker. He did lots of, uh, he was a, uh, he was a, a partner of uh, Chris Marker in a few films, mm. and uh, he did uh, lots of uh, important films during the uh, Revolution Culturelle in China. Mm. He did uh, 12 hour films about the Chinese uh, Revolution Culturelle. Jean, uh, let me ask you what was it like operating sound for a documentary film in the 90s in a place like China? What was that like for you? And then give us a picture of of the logistics of trying to capture sound in a country like that at that time. Oh, it was uh, kind of uh, what you could dream as the most. It was very easy in a way. It, it was extraordinary because well, we the equipment we were, we had was a tape recorder, the Nagra. Yeah, the old Nagra. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we had we had very good equipment. Everything was mono, of of course, but we had uh, uh, an equipment uh, which was kind of uh, uh, excellent. We had a lot of time for recording sound because our 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 film was kind of going very slowly. So we we stayed twice something like three months uh, all around China. And wow. uh, as the things we were filming for the film were very slow, we had lots of time to go all around most of the time with a bicycle. Mm. Uh, and uh, we'd, we'd go around, like how would I say, we'd, we'd go looking for things that we felt were interesting. Yes. Let's say we were on the road and we'd see a little village somewhere uh, uh, far off and we'd go walking there and go around most of the time we would meet people who never had seen white people that's right children sometimes were kind of <laughs> oh, yeah. seeing us and the experience were kind of fantastic because china had been closed a lot yes so some of the provinces were opening for the first time oh. to people so this was kind of incredible for us to see because people were kind of open to us yes. so we would go around and most of the time we would record sounds uh simple ambiences of life uh, agricultural activities yeah with no almost no engines uh, handcraft uh people working wood people uh, People were building roads with only hammers, yes. and uh, you see things which we, so it was kind of a fantastic uh, experience. And in the cities, even in uh, Beijing, yeah. we would have most were on bicycle, very few cars. <laughs> so at six in the evening, the city was full of some kind of a sound of thousands of people on bicycle. Oh. Wow, but and and, I, and mind you, I've I've worked in Beijing a few times over the past uh, handful of years, and um, that is not a sound you have heard in Beijing for many years. <laughs> yes, 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 it changed so much. Yes. So I'd like to turn our attention a little bit towards um, you know the idea of sound being an underappreciated aspect of filmmaking, um, and I think in particular. We might be talking to, in this instance, maybe the independent filmmaker, or in this, in our case, the independent documentary filmmaker. I understand. I've done it. You know, I have done made the mistakes myself. We all have. Which is, as filmmakers, it's easy for um, to concentrate one's focus purely on the visual, and the danger of that, of course, is you're putting your sound at risk. Jean, why do you think sound is often the underappreciated aspect of filmmaking? Underappreciated aspect, it is indeed for those who kind of don't think. Um, it's difficult to explain, but the most difficult uh, about sound is to speak about it, to describe things, yeah. <laughs> to analyze uh, what it is. So as as long as people think about the sound, 
whatever the mistakes they would do, they still take care of sound. Right. I kind of, in in, in my experience, I kind of I kind of dis- discover that uh, there is kind of a plenty of ways to share the, um, the, the the regulation to to sound with a director or mm. with someone not specifically sound person mm. uh, as long as they take care and they're thinking about the message they're they're carrying right so most of the time the the aspect of uh, not taking care of sound is coming from people who purely don't think right you see what i mean they're not conscious they're not they're not being conscious perhaps filmmakers is that what you're saying yes but then some are not conscious but they are kind of uh they have they are carrying something about sound mm. most of the time with uh, uh for fiction films uh, uh i can work with a director not speaking about the sound specifically uh, about sound but just understanding the perception the director has either of what he wants as a project mm. or what sound he's getting on a movie some directors aren't capable to speak about sound. They're only capable to kind of do sounds themselves. Uh, <laughs> right. Saying, okay, the scene is going to be like that. And the, 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 the thing falls and bah, this is the... And they kind of uh, often could kind of sh- show their feelings about sound, but they don't have the words. They don't have the language for it. The, the language, yes. And then sometimes in a, a relationship, then we kind of invent a language between me and a director, yeah. which is a language, which is a, a language specific, a few questions about details in which there is a reason for sound for this or that. Mm. Uh, this is my experience. I think in documentary film, it is a bit the same. If, um, if, if someone making a movie simply kind of denies any sense in what he's listening or kind of uh, doesn't want to perceive anything about the sound, okay, this is kind of the total negation we say in French. Yeah. <laughs> but for the rest, as long as people think they will take care in their own way mm-hmm. of a message coming through the sound. Mm-hmm. Even if they're not totally capable to uh, uh, understand it themselves. You see what I mean? I do. I know it's not clear what I'm saying. No, it does. It, it, it's making sense to me. And it's this idea of, you know, languaging certainly between, in this case, a sound person and the director. A director may be um, someone who doesn't have an appreciation for sound. Um, as you use the word negacion, like that, they, they negate the sound. Um, they don't have an appreciation for it. And so there is a need. I think there's a, there's, there's a couple of things here. You have a per, per, perhaps a professional need to try to make that director understand in a sound way what can better their film. And so let me ask you this. Do you feel like that's part of your responsibility sometimes when you work on a documentary or a feature where you get the sense that maybe the the director doesn't have an appreciation for sound. Is it part of your responsibility to make them understand the language of sound in a way that can help their cinema? I think it is even the kind of principal position Mm. of mine, Mm. Mm. which is, well, which is what made this work uh, so interesting for me. Because I kind of found that indeed there was an enormous space of uh, creativity, let's say, or choices or decisions I would do by myself without anybody interfering in that uh, space, you see. And it makes sense for me to kind of choose things for a project, for a film, in fact, it is my responsibility and it is not the responsibility of a director because our 
kind of. We get interested in very small instants when we do the sound. Yes, the minute we details. Kind of, yes, and we have also some kind of a perception of the kind of instant message mm. that a sound has to uh, give. Mm. What is the first impression, the first moment someone of the audience will hear about, let's say, you going in a factory. Yeah. Where we are building, uh, I don't know, building something. What is this impression that you have to uh, 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 record, transfer this kind of, all the information in three seconds you get, let's say if you were blind, discovering for the first time in one place, with the sound, you would get plenty of information just by listening. <laughs> how big is a place? How many people work? What kind of machines there are? The, um, the intensity of the sound? Is it loud? Is it soft? And where you are in this space, is it... Uh, you see what I mean? Oh, are yes. you near things? Are you far? And everything. These informations there's no need to kind of analyze and explain something. Just in the way you record them, you can give this information or give wrong information. You see what I mean? I so do. <laughs> my kind of, 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 of work is first have some kind of a description of what I choose to give to hear to people. You see what I mean? Hmm. Have a kind of critic a uh, critic way of listening to things to say, am I capturing the sounds and are these sounds saying what I'm seeing, my perception, my personal perception, are these sounds mm. uh, giving this feeling? Mm. You see what I mean? I do. I'm going in the kitchen. I'm going in, in the kitchen. It's not the same as a room. It's not the same as a bedroom. You see what I mean? It's, but we go in there it takes yes it takes two seconds to the audience to know we're in the kitchen yeah right see what right. i mean I because it's weird. i i uh Very basic. if you could see the smile on my face john i have such a massive um appreciation for what, for what you speak of i you know we often um think of uh, we often we often think of the camera person or the dp as the person who who best tells the story like one of their chief 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 jobs or critical jobs is to shape the director's vision right to tell the story in visuals and it's easy to not recognize or realize that the sound person's job theirs is in many ways precisely the same only it's with sound. Your job is to tell the story in the best way you can tell that story using sound. Sound as yes. a storyteller. Yes, yes, exactly. Exactly. But you know, it is kind of a pleasure to think that uh, this, uh, all these information, hmm. you kind of pass them very discreetly <laughs> which is something you can play with a little bit yes it makes me think of uh you know jean i i, I was going to hold off until later in the conversation but this seems an appropriate time to bring up a, a, a young woman who her name is uh majida and she goes by the name of Maggie yes. Cabaretti. Do you remember working yes. with Maggie? Yes, yes, I remember her and, very well. Yes, yes, and she was working, from my understanding, she was working as an assistant um, uh, in the sound department for the film Incendies. And what you're describing, I would like to take a moment to read an email that she wrote me very recently. And she was, uh, and it really kind of goes along exactly with what you're saying. And she's, Jean, she's talking directly about to you and your expertise as a sound engineer on set. She wrote, One crew member was flabbergasted at how much attention to detail Jean works. The crew member was complaining how Jean even would set up mics to catch the footsteps of the actor, along with this main speech and the action that was being recorded. At times, he would work through the lunch break on an exhausting schedule just to get some good extras and atmosphere bites for the sound designer to choose from. 
The sound designer who worked in Cindy's said it was amazing to mix his sound because he thought of every detail. Um, that's you they're speaking of, and, and with good reason. It is your approach. It is the way that you look at sound and your sound work on a film. And there is a reason that someone like yourself um, is part of a team that is nominated for best sound on a picture um, on something like Amelie for the Oscars. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, just brilliant, just brilliant. Thank you. Jean, <laughs> what are some common mistakes that we make, you know, especially in the documentary film, often we don't have a lot of resources and, and finances at our disposal. What are some of the common mistakes that you see us making as filmmakers, as doc filmmakers, when it comes to sound? Oh, well, then we, we come to a very practical part because what I also like, you know, in, in sound is how it, things are very practical. Mm, mm. Where is a microphone? Will you put a microphone at the right place and then you get the good sound? You see what I mean? <laughs> and and you, you do that with very, I build lots of little things by myself yeah. just to make them practical so that it fits the way I want it to fit. So what I kind of see as a, main mistake in many documentary films is is the way people handle a microphone especially especially with the with the wind when they're outside <laughs> uh, i saw many times that sounds well i imagine people working alone with a camera with yes. a, a set setup for sound that they've done together with their camera equipment yes uh, filming outside with a microphone needs to make it uh, very well protected uh, mm. with the wind mm. uh, you know what i mean what when the wind blows in, in the microphone so this is very important the way you 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 put a microphone but also the way you suspend the microphone so that you don't destroy or ruin the sound with your hands around a cable transmitted to the microphone itself right uh, so um, the shock mount is important and even the cable you use oh, yes. from the microphone oh, yes. to, to the cap very important so these are the most uh, practical details that I think uh, the, the first thing to think about is what, what microphone do I use? Okay. Now, if I have this microphone, even if it's a good microphone, if the wind blows in it directly, then the sound will be totally destroyed. Yeah. And if each time I move my finger, there is a, a, a noise in the microphone. This is how is my shock mount? This is how is my cable? <laughs> I very often uh put a very thin cable coming out of the microphone mm. to a plug whatever it is mm. so that the the weight of the cable is uh is uh, light so that it doesn't transmit noises ah, Do you think? right yes so this uh am i answering your question you are and not only that i would love to further this discussion i would like to hear from you some more easy tips that perhaps we doc filmmakers can be using. And again, you know, the description here is picture, Jean, picture, if you will, the one person crew or a two person crew. And in this case, a one person crew might be, yeah, I'm the director, I'm shooting it and I've got to capture sound. What are some very practical tips that you can think of that we can be using? What are some other tips? Huh. Well, um, either, either you set a microphone on your camera, mm which is possible with some microphones, as long as you don't take big, very big microphones. You see the uh, shotguns or things like that. Yeah. Uh, they may be too big for a, a, a camera right. to, to make it uh, easy to, to handle and everything. So there are some shorter microphones. And let's consider the microphone as an ensemble mm. altogether with some good shock mount yeah there is a very good uh, for for kind of classical microphones uh shock mount which is uh, sure i think a 52 or 53 which is kind of cheap uh, uh cheap shock mount th that works very well for uh 
putting on the camera. You know, Sean, I, I, Sean, I want to stop yeah. you there. For, I want, I'd like to stop you there for a moment and, and forgive the interruption. But I think the shock mount, it can often be an accessory to sound that is easily forgotten. Some think that you simply, you have a boom pole or a, sh- a handheld shotgun and you put the shotgun mic on the end of that. Can you explain to us why is it important that you have a good uh, functioning shock mount? What, what's the importance of the shock mount for those who may not know? Oh, the, the importance is uh, very simple. Uh, a microphone, if, if, uh, if you hold it directly, will you, your, your hands will be, tr- your, the noises of the contact with the microphone is uh, transmitted to the, the capsule. Right. So, you, you, each time you move your fingers, you will transmit a noise to your microphone, which goes in the, the sound directly. Yeah. So the, the, the capsule must be suspended. The microphone has be, to be suspended so that the noises that you do around of handling it is not transmitted to the capsule. Right, exactly. So uh, the, the way the sound can be transmitted is, of course, acoustically, but also by contact. So if you have whatever the length of your cable is, mm. if you're touching with a boom pole a cable, mm. then the cable goes to the microphone and this is transmitted to the capsule. Mm-hmm. This is why I was kind of, uh, um, uh, I very often use a 15 or 20 centimeter cable yeah. with then a plug and then a microphone cable or whatever. Mm. But most of the time, if you have your microphone set on the camera, you have a short, thin cable that goes to the plug, your 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 XLR most of the time, yeah. plug in the camera. Uh, this is very important. This makes an enormous difference for the sound because then the, uh, the suspension, the shock mount, will really isolate the microphone from the camera. Yes. And this is, this is important. And of course... I- but saying the windshield mm. uh, for the exterior. Yeah, the windscreen, uh, which right. is Yes, yeah, windscreen, sorry. Yep. Uh, a windscreen most of the time needs some little air volume around the microphone. Mm. So it is important to think how mechanically you can build something big enough so that there is some kind of a volume inside the windshield. Oh, what is the importance, John, of having that little space between the microphone and the windscreen? What's the importance of having a little bit of space like that? I don't know exactly. I think the moving of the air yeah. is something relative to the volume of uh, this protected air inside a windshield. Wow, okay. When we have too small volume around the microphone, then it's kind of difficult to stop the wind uh, problems, troubles. And and Jean, let's talk a little bit about the lavalier. Give us some very easy tips that can give us better sound with our laves. Oh, um, not, not bury them <laughs> under thick clothes and things like that. Yeah. The more... <laughs> Uh, open it is the better it is so to 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 have the best sound for uh, preciseness of a voice you absolutely need to have the maximum is some kind of a thickness of a t-shirt as soon as you have some sweatshirt or uh, thicker clothes above uh, a microphone then you're sure that you're kind of uh, damaging the sound making it less clear really for, ah, right. for understanding the the, boy, the the words. You see what I mean? I do, I do. What is important, I think, for someone making his own film is to be aware that during all the work, it, it has to be careful about the sound. Mm. It's, it's not just uh, something, it is heavy to carry, sound and picture all together. It's not so easy to have just a, a good system, sound system mm. working with your camera. It is kind of a, something to think to listen about all the time. You see what I mean? I uh, sure do. Capturing pictures and being conscious of what the sound is at that 
moment. I've been helping often friends to equip themselves with uh, sound systems for, for, for their films that, that, that they, they'd go to do them, themselves alone, you see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I see a big difference between people who kind of go and are kind of freewheeling for the sound and then start listening to the sound after they've finished filming yeah. and uh, discover then things which were damaged, which were bad or good things, but which were kind of left and not cared of. That's right. And the big difference between people who kind of listen, are careful of what they're recording during their filming and everything. It makes a very big difference of uh, um, conception of what you're doing. There is another thing I wanted to say about uh, recording sounds for people, uh, say people, people alone or in very small crews. There are rather cheap uh, little recorders that are very good that you can use, which are, you know, there is a Zoom H4 and there is a, also a Roland, a Roland yes. uh, recorder. We're recording this episode on a Zoom H6. Okay. And they're very good recorders and, and very practical. And you can, you, so sometimes it can be, because it's rather easy now with a software to synchronize sounds yeah. from those little recorders. So it's an, an option to uh, then have a, a recorder independent. That's right. Uh, which you can also record wild tracks, wild sounds. I love it for wild sound. Absolutely. Especially those little recorders. I very on yeah. on fiction films. I use the recorders like that because I some sometimes I hide them somewhere. Yeah. I put a big uh, big uh, SD card inside. Yep. And I record for hours. Oh. And I come back, get back my recorder. And listen to what I captured. Sometimes, you know, you don't have. Let's, for example, if I'm in a train station mm. doing a, a fiction films, we, we we never have time to record announces, yeah. record <laughs> uh, 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 sounds, interesting sounds of the trains or things like that, because we are on set and we all the time have noise around us. So I kind of hide the microphone somewhere with this little recorder, it turns all day, and then I get all the sounds I needed, you see, announces, train noises, and things like that. Or in nature, it's very interesting also. Jean, please come shoot with me in Cambodia someday. Please come record, <laughs> please come record sound for me. <laughs> That's absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Jean, as we wrap up here on The Documentary Life, do you have any final thoughts that you might like to impart to us Perhaps something about sound um, that we haven't gone over yet that might be important for for doc filmmakers to know about. The 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 most important for me, I think, in 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 sound or in sound in documentaries, is to let the things say what they have to say, rather than imagining that we need some kind of Speaking to explain things that are the reality. Uh... So, how can I say the most important for me is to let place for the reality to come through the sounds in some situations, and uh, for a, a documentary filmmaker uh, to respect a situation rather than thinking that. A few words can explain a situation mm. afterwards. You see what I mean? I sure do. Um, I sure do. Well, it's this whole that whole idea of building story with sound, as opposed to sort of you know they talk about it with with picture. They say you know show me, don't tell me, and it's the same with sound. You know, let's hear it. Don't tell me the story with your voice, or don't narrate it if we can hear the story. <laughs> and it is. Uh, it's not easy, but also then in that way of would it be the word inquiring? I don't know. Looking for looking for sound. I think it's very rich and important to think that you could stick a sound on another picture. That means you could you could kind of 
think of recording lots of sounds without a camera mm. and make it make sense with another picture. You see, there are two ways of respecting a reality in a documentary film. You can you can kind of re, re, relay on what you're filming with the synchron sound of this instant. Yes, but it is also sometimes very interesting to record sound and only sound and then maybe use this sound with other pictures because sometimes it will bring you something very interesting. And this is rather a bit unusual on documentary films because I see some documentary films have a, a kind of voiceover which will kind of kill most of uh, the the uh, the reality. Yeah. Okay. Another way of doing is having uh, correct or good synchron sound, which tells things at the same time as a picture. But what is interesting is sometimes to go around a situation, have recordings. Because you, you were giving me the example of the film Nenet. I was surprised that you knew this film, which is very, uh, well, for me, it is a, a, an experience very interesting, but I didn't know you, you would know it. And uh, we did this film in a very short uh, time. Uh, and I was recording, um, very much recording non synchronous sound, mm, mm, which mm. were used very much as a, uh, all outside the picture. Mm, I see. And uh, it worked very well. And uh, you see, typically, uh, all these sounds uh, were full of meanings for the picture. Right. For the situation. Uh, In that film, many sounds were recorded, yeah. uh, not synchron. You see what I mean? I do. I do. Yeah, that's great. It creates a wonderful soundscape. And it, and it goes to this idea that we can be doing that with our doc films. It is not expressly tied to narrative or feature. And it's something that we as doc filmmakers, I think we can go a long way in becoming better doc filmmakers and storytellers if we're thinking of sound in this sort of way and not just simply, well, I need to record people talking. I need to record a conversation. I need to record an interview. If we can become more conscious filmmakers as doc filmmakers with our sound telling story, it will go a very, very long way into really separating our films from other films. Yes, that's right. Yes, that's exactly what I think. Yeah. Jean, what an absolute pleasure. I'm so happy that Maggie made me aware of you and your work. And um, I've been looking to have a conversation with a sound person of your caliber for quite some time. It has truly been an honor. Thank you so much for being on, on the documentary life. Okay, thank you very much. I hope uh, my words were, were, were okay for you, Chris. I, but it was a pleasure to speak with you. And, uh, and I like very much the idea of people uh, maybe not so professional listening to it mm. and seeing it as uh, information. I, I like this very much. You see what I mean? It's, for me, it's very important because I, I feel that people going the experience of making a film they don't need to be professional mm. to have good ideas, mm. to be yeah, kind of uh, creative. People have their language very easily, so they people can make films from everywhere. It's, it's, it's important. <laughs> it is. It is. Brilliant discussion. Thank you, John. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. Don't forget, we'd love to have you join us in the Documentary Academy. Come and take a look at how we can help you make your best documentary film at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. That's thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon. Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.